Hello and welcome back to A Slice of Physics. In this video, we will learn about magnetism making a transition to a new topic in this course. We will first see what magnetism is, what are the three types of materials as it relates to their magnetic properties, how these properties are similar to and different from the electrical properties we have studied so far, how are magnetic field lines represent it. All right, so to give you a little bit of a historic lesson, um, people have been playing with magnets for a very long time. Many centuries ago, people found certain things naturally that they called lodestones that exhibited some interesting properties. So if somebody picked up a lodestone that looked like this from the ground, they noticed that it would attract filings of iron. So if I had some little pieces of iron here, those iron pieces will get jump up and stick to the lodestone. Now, they would stick to this end of the lodestone, and if you move the iron filings over here, they would also stick to the other end of the lodestone. They'll stick all around the lodestone. The other property is if somebody did find two lodestones, so let's say they had a lodestone over here shaped like this, and another lodestone here, shaped like this, they found that when they brought these two ends close together, there was a strong attraction. But if they moved this lodestone here, I'm going to try to draw it the same shape, I won't succeed, but let's say this is lodestone A, lodestone B, and they moved lodestone A over here, here it would get pushed away. So here, B was getting pulled towards A, A was being pulled towards B, we had an attraction. Here there was a repulsion. So simply by moving the lodestone to the other end, they saw that lodestone B would push lodestone A away, whereas it attracted it on this end. And then there were other materials. So if I have a lodestone here and I got paper, if I've got wood, uh, I've got, let's say, rubber uh, and even some metals like aluminum, copper, etc. There was no response, no attraction, no repulsion. Okay, so right away we can see that there are three properties here. There are some materials like iron, nickel, cobalt that are attracted to both ends of a magnet. And then there are certain things like magnets, we'll call these guy magnets, that are attracted to one end and repelled from other end. And then there are certain things that include all non-metals, most materials are in this category, that do not respond to magnets at all. No attraction or repulsion. Uh, this includes all non-metals, and surprisingly, it includes most metals as well. It's very few metals that are like iron, nickel, and cobalt, nickel and cobalt that are attracted to magnets. So how do we make sense of all this? Well, let's talk about it in context of some of the things we have already discussed in the electric sense. So we saw early on in the semester that uh, when you brought a charged rod, let's say you put some excess positive charges on this rod and you brought it next to a Coke can, I showed this experiment in class, it made the Coke can roll and move toward um, the charged rod. We also saw that if I brought um, a charged rod close to an electroscope, it made the leaves at the bottom of the electroscope. So if I bring a charged rod here with excess positive charges, it doesn't matter if it's excess positive charges, it could also be excess negative charges uh, but if I bring a charge rod with excess charge of either kind close to an electroscope, it made these leaves swing apart. 
And as long as I didn't touch it, if I removed the rod from the vicinity of the electroscope, the leaves collapsed back to being just straight down. Okay, so there's no rod, uh, the leaves collapse back. So I'm gonna show this as dotted leaves that are collapsing back in, in the absence of a charged rod in the vicinity. And then if I touched the uh, uh, charged rod to the electroscope, then the leaves spread apart. So let's say I touched the negatively charged rod to the electroscope, it transferred some of its negative charges to the rod and the leaves uh, were spread apart. And even after I removed the um, charged rod, after I touched it, the excess charges remain on the electroscope. So the leaves continue to stay apart until I touch them and ground them with my finger. Um, so we have discussed all this before in this course. Let's see if we can make sense out of the magnetic uh, properties using these concepts. So to study these magnetic properties, we're gonna model things like a bar magnet. It's the easiest to visualize when we have a bar magnet kind of shape where one pole is north, the other pole is south. So let's start listing some of the properties here. So we see that uh, mag magnets are made of two poles, two and only two poles, and they are either north or south. By analogy to the electrical system, let's look at uh, charges. Charges come in only two kinds, as you know, and there we call them positive and negative. For magnet, we call them north and south, and we call them poles. Now, when, if I have two magnets, we see some properties right away. So if I have a north pole and a south pole here, and if I bring another magnet next to it, where I put the north pole here and south pole here, I see a strong attraction. You have probably all played with magnets and you have experienced this for yourself. Now, if I flip one of these magnets, I got north here, south here, and I flip the second one to put the south here and north here, now I see a strong repulsion. This is what makes magnets really fun to play with, uh, is these repulsions, because we can make them jump around and fly away and things like that. So listing some more properties, we see that opposites, opposite poles, attract, like poles repel. In my example, I showed two south poles repelling, but if you switch it around and put two north poles next to each other, they will also repel. Once again, you see the uh, analogy between these magnetic properties and electric properties. Uh, we had opposite charges attracting and like charges repelling. So there are a lot of similarities between magnetic properties and electric properties, but there are some differences too. We'll talk about that in a second. But continuing our discussion about the different types of uh, magnetic materials, uh, let's see what happens when we have other kinds of materials. So if I bring a magnet with its North Pole and South Pole near a piece of rubber or paper or wood or whatever, uh, there is no response. And that's because these rubber and paper and all of these materials are actually made of, when you look into them, they have magnets. And I'm going to point an arrow uh, towards the north. So if I have this um, arrow, so when I point an arrow, little arrow over here, you see the north at the tip of the arrow and south at the tail of the arrow. So it's made of a lot of little magnets. But the issue is there's trillions upon trillions and they are all randomly oriented. Some are pointing up and down, some are pointing uh, left, some are pointing right, some are pointing 20 degrees to the east and so on and so forth. 
but they, because there are so many and they're all randomly pointed, they all the, the net effect is that they all cancel each other. So there is no net magnetic property. So because there is no net magnetic property, there is no response when you bring a magnet close to it, there is no reaction. But something interesting happens when there are certain special types of material. And those special types of materials include only certain kinds of metals. Um, it's iron, cobalt, and nickel for the most part. So with those metals, so let's say I'm gonna take an iron, piece of iron, and bring a north, uh, bring a magnet close to it, and here I got a piece of iron, okay? What makes iron, nickel, and cobalt special is that they are also made of these trillions upon trillions of little mini magnets inside, um, and which are all randomly oriented. So no difference so far. But when you bring another magnet close to it, these little magnets in the iron piece are all able to spin. So because they're able to spin, I'm gonna change colors here so it doesn't get confusing. They will all, because the South Pole is gonna attract the North Pole, they will all spin and orient themselves this way. So the trillions upon trillions of little V magnets that were all randomly oriented and canceling each other before, in the presence of a magnet, they will all orient themselves with the north to the left and the south to the right in response to the fact that opposites pole attract and these magnets are free to spin. And by doing that, they end up creating temporarily a north pole here and a south pole here. So you will recognize the similarity in this between the electroscope experiment and the aluminum can rolling as to what's happening here is that I am inducing a magnetic dipole. Just like we were inducing an electric dipole by bringing a charge rod near an aluminum can or an electroscope, in this case, I'm inducing a magnetic dipole. And so it will attract. And if I switch it around, uh, the attraction part doesn't change. Remember, the, it didn't matter if the charge rod was positively charged or negatively charged. Either way, it attracted an external object. So in this case, if I switch it around and bring an iron piece close to the north end of a magnet, now all of these little bitty magnets that are available to spin will spin with their north poles pointing to the right like that. So that'll induce a magnetic dipole with the south pole to the left and north pole to the right. And that'll also cause it to attract. Okay, so either way, it's gonna attract. So these kinds of materials like iron, cobalt, and nickel will be attracted to both the South Pole and the North Pole of any external magnet. So let's talk next about some of the differences before we wrap up this video. And in order to do that, I'm just gonna first introduce this concept of a compass. You guys have all used compasses before, I'm guessing. Uh, a compass is simply a magnet, and I'm gonna paint one end of the magnet, which is the North Pole. And it's a little piece of magnet that's pivoted on a very sharp tip. So I'm looking at it from the top here. Um, it is uh, free to spin around that central pivot. So by if I position it in an area where there is an external magnetic field, so for whatever reason, let's say the external magnetic field in this region points like this. Why it does that, we will see in a second. But if I place the compass in this area, it'll rotate because it is free to rotate around that tip that it's balanced on, and it's gonna point this way where the north pole of the magnet points along the magnetic field lines. So a compass is simply a magnet that's free to rotate, and the it'll align itself with the north pole or the painted end, it's usually also the painted end of the compass, that point along the magnetic field line. So similar to electric field lines, there are magnetic field lines, which is what we're talking about here. Okay, I'm gonna clear up some room here uh, so I can talk about some of the differences. Now the differences are that, uh, by the way, this magnet is just a magnetic dipole, right? And you guys know what an electric dipole is. So an electric dipole is an object 
where there is a separation between the positive and negative charges. Just like in a magnetic dipole, there's a separation between the North Pole and the South Pole. So one important difference is that even though there are similarities, you can't think that a negative end of an electric dipole is going to attract the North Pole of a magnet. No, that doesn't happen. No attraction between a negative charge and a North Pole um, and or so on. Uh, similarly, if I bring near a compass, if I bring a charged rod, the compass is not going to rotate in response to the charged rod. It's not going to respond to the presence of an electric field. It's only going to respond to the presence of a magnetic field. And another important difference is that with charges, we have dipoles, but we also had monopoles. So if I have a an object where I have a single positive charge at the left and single negative charge at the right, I can take a scissor or something and cut it into two pieces and that end up with just a positive charge and just a negative charge. So these guys would be called just charges is what we've called them so far, but you can think of them in our current context as electric monopoles. The strange things about magnets is that if you take a magnet and cut it in two pieces, it's still going to have a North Pole and a South Pole. So if I take this magnet and cut it here, the little piece here is going to have South here, North here. The piece to the right is going to have South here, North here. And then if you cut it again, uh, it's going to have South North, South North, South North, South North, and so on. So no matter how much you cut it, even if you get down to a single electron, a single electron itself is a magnetic dipole. So the one other important difference is that there are no magnetic monopoles. All right, uh, before I wrap up, I just wanna talk about magnetic field lines a little bit more. So let me erase some of these things and create some room. So once again, I will take the example of the electric uh, dipole and see what the electric field lines there look and then see the comparison between that and magnetic field lines. So if I have an electric dipole here with the positive charge on this end and negative charge on this end, we've seen before that the electric field lines point away from positive towards negative, so they will look something like this. It turns out that magnetic field lines are also very similar. So if I have a bar magnet, with the North Pole here and the South Pole here, the magnetic field lines point away from the North Pole and toward the South Pole, so they look just like electric field lines for an electric dipole, they look very similar to that. And then if you place a compass, which is nothing but another little magnet that's able to spin on its axis at various points, if you place one here, it's gonna align itself with the painted end pointing along magnetic field lines. If you place one here, it's gonna point this way. If you place one here, it's gonna point itself this way with the painted end always pointing along the magnetic field line. All right, I think that's good for wrapping up our concepts about the introduction to magnetism. So let's quickly review. So we saw that there are three kinds of materials, materials that don't respond to magnets, which is most, most materials, every non-metal and most metals. Then we saw that there are certain types of materials that are attracted to both poles of a magnet that included metals like iron, cobalt, and nickel. And then we saw that there are certain things that are attracted to one pole and repelled from another pole. These simply are magnets. A compass, we realized, is just a magnet that's free to spin and aligns with external magnetic field lines. We saw that magnets are nothing but magnetic dipoles. And remember that um, there are no magnetic monopoles in the universe. Even the elementary particles of protons and electrons have both the North and the South Pole. Uh, so that's a difference between magnets and charges. And magnetic field lines point from North Pole to South Pole, just like electric field lines point from positive to negative. Um, and it's important to remember that that is the direction it points outside the magnet. So if I look into the magnet, the continuation of the magnetic field line actually 
inside the magnet will go from south to north. So there's that tends to be a source of confusion sometimes, but we are talking about which way these things point outside the magnet and not inside the magnet. Just like when we were talking about electric circuits, we said current goes from high potential to low potential outside the battery, but inside the battery, the battery does work and has it go from low to high potential. All right, thank you.